Well, today you begin a new thinker, St. Thomas Aquinas. I think one of the virtues of Paul's 101 is that it's a course that tries to open up options for you. And I think it's important that one of those options is a moral and political philosophy that's based on religious belief. After all, in the Islamic world, religious belief is very much alive. There are many fundamentalist Christians in the West. I myself am a skeptic, but I'll try and present St. Thomas initially at least as convincingly as I can, because it's up to you to draw your own conclusions about the nature and existence of God. But if you do believe in God, clearly that colors your whole outlook and your everyday life. Kierkegaard once said that it set him at fear and trembling, the notion that he was living his life under the eye of a perfect judge. And certainly someone who believes in God and believes in the afterlife is going to believe that the whole purpose of the state is to encourage the conditions under which you can achieve salvation. So you must make up your own minds as to whether religious belief underlies moral and political philosophy or whether it doesn't. This is nothing peculiar. You've probably learned by now that every thinker's theory of being underlies their theory of knowledge, which underlies their moral and political philosophy. I take it Plato's doctrine of forms and his notion that through ascending the divided line you can discover the good about good and evil. These things are the cornerstones of Plato's political and moral philosophy. St. Thomas is no different. Uh, metaphysics is more fundamental than anything else. After all, if you don't believe in God, there's no such science as theology. If you do believe in God, moral and political philosophy have to be based on that theology. Well, with that introduction, let's try and put St. Thomas into a context. He borrows from both Plato and Aristotle. His great achievement to his mind was the integration of the wisdom of the ancients with Christian belief. And he thought that these two things should strengthen one another rather than weaken one another. We come from a time, of course, where religion often regards philosophy and science as an enemy. That is, as something that may encroach on its territory. But St. Thomas thought that the wisdom of Plato and Aristotle, rather than encroaching on Christianity or posing an alternative to it, actually rendered Christianity more rationally demonstrable. One of the things about St. Thomas, as opposed to many who believe today, is that he thought that about nine-tenths of Christian belief could be rendered rationally palatable. He did reserve that there is a, a small area of faith that could not be derived by logic or by reason or by wisdom. But he thought that most of Christian belief could be shown to be compatible with reason and that it was not just a matter of being based on emotion. He doesn't, of course, discount religious fervor. Uh, you have to have the love of God as in addition to a rational acknowledgement of the existence of God. But he did not think that religion had to be based on emotional fervor. It could be based on reason. Now, in order to understand St. Thomas, we have to make explicit what he felt was valid in Plato and Aristotle. He thought that Aristotle was the key to moral and political <laughs> philosophy. And we won't be covering much of that in this lecture. That we'll have for a later lecture, will we not? Uh, but he thought that theology, rather than borrowing primarily from Aristotle, could be clarified by Plato. And here I'll have to say something about Plato's metaphysics, that is his doctrine of forms. You may recall that Plato believed in three levels of being. That is, they're the particular people that I see in this room, and they're particular tables that I might see in this room. Here is a table and there's one over there, and there are a variety of chairs in this room. There's a purple chair there and a blue one over in the corner, and you're sitting on sort of blue uh, scribe's chairs. And one level of reality then is the physical world. But you remember, standing above the physical world is the world of forms, is it not? And in that world, you have non-physical entities. I take it you have to posit a form of chair. 
<laughs> and why do you have to posit a form of chair? Well, because we can classify them. As you know, we can tell chairs from tables, can we not? And therefore, there must be a concept of chair that allows us to do that. I take it that concept might be absent in an Eskimo. I don't know. In polar Eskimos, there may be no tables and chairs. But you can distinguish tables and chairs, and therefore you must have a general idea of chair. And that must somehow cover the two chairs that have the least in common. One of these might be a modern aluminium chair and the other might be a traditional Victorian armchair. But you call them both by the same name, so you must have a concept that's broad enough to cover them both, must you not? And it must tell you what those two chairs that resemble one another least have more in common that they don't have in common with a table. That, he thinks, follows logically. Now you can see why the general ideas are not reducible to sense images. If you had a sense image chair, it would have to have a particular color such as blue, wouldn't it? Well, it would be ridiculous to say that things that weren't blue weren't chairs. You know, if the general idea of chair was blue, that would mean brown things couldn't be chairs, could they? So the general ideas are not reducible to sense images. They would have to be colorless. Well, no physical chair can be without color, can it? So your concept of chair has to be not reducible to a sense image. It has to be general. We won't go into why Plato thought that these general ideas had real existence in the world of forms, but we can get an idea of what he's talking about. I take it you have never seen a perfectly straight line. Any line that I drew on the blackboard would deviate from straightness to some degree, even if I use this as a ruler. There would be some imperfection in a great straight line that I drew on the backboard. You know, there's one. Well, it's pretty straight, but it's not perfect, is it? And insofar as it lacks perfection, it falls short of what a straight line really is. What is a straight line? What's the definition? What's the definition in geometry of a straight line? Who remembers from high school? Over there. The closest, the, um, fastest distance between two points. Yeah, it's the shortest distance between two points. Well, any line that I draw on the blackboard will have a bump or a dent in it, won't it? So it won't be the shortest di distance between two points. In other words, by falling short of being perfect, it falls short of the essence of a straight line. So nothing in the physical universe can be perfect. Everything, that's because it's made of matter. You see, the line I've tried to draw on the blackboard is a material line, isn't it? So it's a mere imitation of the concept of straight line that you got when you studied geometry. You can tell straight lines from crooked lines. You have the concept. You know that crooked lines aren't the shortest distance between <laughs> two points. But that concept can never be represented in the physical universe because the physical universe is made of matter. No carpenter can ever make a perfect chair because wood is not infinitely malleable, is it? I mean, a carpenter may get four legs of a chair pretty near the same length, but he or she will never get the four legs exactly the same length, will they? So, although the carpenter may have the concept of a perfect chair in mind, any chair that he or she tries to fashion in the physical world will to some degree fall short of that perfection, won't it? And by falling short of the perfection of a straight line, you fall short of what a straight line really is. So now we have two levels of being in Plato. We have the physical objects in this room that are tangible and we interact with through the senses and which are imperfect and which are impermanent. All of us will die someday. Every piece of wood in this room will rot someday. And then we have the general ideas which are perfect and eternal and, re and capture what things really are. I take it the general idea of straight line. If the human race is exterminated and some new race evolves that has rationality, when they discover geometry, they will recover the same idea of straight line we have today, won't they? You know, it is eternal in a sense. It's always there to be discovered by a rational mind. So the sensible world we may approach through the senses. 
The realm of forms or ideas, our mind must fix on those to learn their contents. Uh, the, the concept of a straight line doesn't exist among pre-industrial peoples. That is, you won't find someone in the highlands of New Guinea who can do geometry, and it would be meaningless to ask them what a cube was, or what uh, an isosceles triangle was, or what a straight line was. That doesn't mean that the world of farms doesn't exist for them, they're just unaware of it. Their mind's eye has never turned towards it. So the second level of Plato, of course, is the realm of forms, the realm of perfect essences, of things that are, can't, are not other than they are, and they're eternal and unchanging. Well, if we had to posit a general idea of chair to cover, the form, to cover all the chairs in this room, and we would have to posit a general idea of humanity to cover all the people in this room, and we would have to posit a general idea of human society to cover New Zealand and Russia and Argentina and America, because you can tell human societies from ant societies, can't you? So you must have a general idea of what it is to be a human society, but it would have to be broad enough to cover all the differing societies that exist in the physical world. So for every class of objects, there's a general idea or form that is not reducible to a sense image. Well, now we have a new class of objects that we can distinguish from other things, and these are the forms themselves, are they not? You see, we have created a new class of existing things, namely the general ideas. There's the general idea of straight line, the general idea of chair, the general idea of human society, the general idea of human being, the general idea of cloud, the general idea of space. You now have a new set of things, and I take it we can distinguish them from the physical universe, can't we? Because they are perfect, they are eternal, and they are quite different from the world you see around you, which is imperfect and changing. So we must have a general idea of what it is to be a general idea. You see the chain of argument. You know, the fact that we can distinguish the multiplicity of chairs from a table means we have to have a general idea of chair. And the fact that we can distinguish the world of forms from the physical universe means you must have a general idea of what it is to be a form. And that, of course, Plato calls the chief good. And that is the third level of Plato's metaphysics. There would be some, I told you that each of the forms was perfect, didn't I? I take it that the, only the carpenter's concept of chair is a perfect chair. Only the geometer's concept of a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Only it is the perfect straight line, isn't it? Obviously, it would be only the form of human society that would be a perfect human society. And that, of course, is what Plato was describing in the Republic. That is, he is trying to give you as good a description as he could of the form of human society. Any human society in the real world will have some defect in it, won't it? So we would have to go to the world of forms to know what justice was, the perfect human society. What then would the chief good be like? Well, it would be absolute form. It would be an absolute concept of perfection. Plato doesn't claim at the time of the Republic, you'll remember, to be able to discern the chief good. You remember the analogy of the cave where you come out of the cave into the real world and your eyes are not strong enough to look at the sun, are they? And you have to look at the sun as reflected in pools of water, you remember. Well, Plato felt that even his mind at the age of 40 when he wrote The Republic was not sufficiently powerful to have a direct apprehension of the chief good. He could only look at the individual forms in which it was reflected. You know, he could do geometry, he could write about the perfect state of human society. He could look at these individual forms, but the concept of form was to some degree beyond him, but he had inklings of it. I take it that a beautiful painting, we say it's beautiful because of some harmony in the relationship between its parts. We say that the just society is perfect because of a harmony between the classes that make it up. You remember it was supposed to be ruled by the philosopher kings, 
The auxiliaries were supposed to be essentially the army and the police force, and the masses carried on the economic functions of society. But there was a harmony between classes, wasn't there? That is, those who were preeminent in reason got on with governing, those who were preeminent in courage got on with defending the society, and those who were preeminent as creative artists and artisans got on with the everyday work of society. And they did not impinge on each other's functions. So just as you have the, a beautifully functioning machine, I take it in a machine the parts don't fight with one another, do they? They have all been harnessed to a common purpose and they have a harmony, which is why the machine works. Uh, so Plato thought that the chief good must be some divine concept of harmony that was broad enough to cover justice, goodness, uh, justice, beauty, and truth. Because he said, after all, why does the thing have the perfection we call beauty or aesthetic perfection? It's because of a beautiful harmony and balance among its parts. You know, you look at a great painting and you see that the proportions are somehow just right. You know, that's what makes it a great painting. And the colors are just right. And the foreground and the background complement one another. Uh, so we know that beauty is a kind of a harmony. Truth is a kind of a balance. What makes an equation true? Well, that it's balanced on both sides of the equal sign, isn't it? You know, 3 plus 3 equals 6 is a true equation. 3 plus 3 equals 5 isn't. So truth uh, has a harmony. And goodness or justice has a harmony. It's a harmonious society which is ordered by a common purpose. So he thought the chief good must be some type of divine concept of perfection or a divine concept of harmony. And beauty and truth and goodness were all sort of specific examples of that. Just as the chairs in this room are specific examples of the form of chair, so the things in the world of form were sort of specific exemplars of the chief good. You see then the very beautiful whole of Plato's theory of being. That is, it has, a, Bertrand Russell once described it as having a sublime beauty akin to that of the greatest sculpture. Whether all of it is true is another question. But you can't deny the beauty of the intellectual creation. Uh, this notion of a hierarchical realm of be being in which all things are explained. You know, we know why the physical world is in flux and nothing is permanent, it's made of matter. We know why the realm of forms is eternal, well it's immaterial, it doesn't decay like matter does. The concept of straight line will be the same a million years from now that it is today. None of you will survive a hundred years. And we have on top of the whole edifice the concept of the chief good, this divine principle of harmony which lends perfection to the forms. You remember the simile of the sun, that just as the sun gives light and vitality to the physical universe, you know, without the sun our planet would shrivel up and die, without the chief good the world of forms would not have the characteristics of beauty and truth and justice. Well, now that we've reviewed Plato's metaphysics, we can see later that Aquinas is going to make use of them in trying to understand the nature of God and also important for a Christian, the nature of angelic life. Because scripture tells us about angels, doesn't it? Archangels and cherubim and seraphim and powers and thrones and glories. And somehow, as Christian believers, we have to make sense of an angel and we've got to do better than artists do. I mean, they just show one with someone with flowing robes and a halo around their head. But it's really identical with a picture of a person, isn't it? Except for the halo, and even saints have halos around their heads in pictures. So art gives us no real concept of what an angel is. It, it makes us an uh, angel sort of like Casper, the cartoon ghost. Have any of you seen those films? with Casper, and the only way he's different from you is he can walk through walls and he doesn't weigh anything. Well, this is a rather superficial notion of what an angel would be, isn't it? That they can walk through walls and if you put them on a scale they wouldn't register any weight. Uh, so as a Christian, St. Thomas makes, wants to make sense not only of the nature of God, but also of the nature of angels. Now before we can really put Plato's concepts to work, 
to puzzle out what God and angels are, there's of course a preliminary question, is there not? And that is, do we have grounds for believing in the existence of God? And St. Thomas rejects one proof that he thinks is falsely adhered to. St. Anselm had offered a proof of the existence of God, but St. Thomas feels that that proof is a threat to Christian belief because it's defective. And when people realize it's defective, they may lose their faith. He wants to substitute for Anselm's proof his five ways, and that is he thinks he has five proofs of the existence of God. So what we'll do, we will first take a look at why he rejects Anselm's proof, and then we'll look at the five ways, that is, the valid proofs he feels he can offer for the existence of God. And that may take us a good deal of today. That is, today we may have to spend much of the rest of our time scrutinizing these six proofs of the existence of God, and if we have time we may get to something rather interesting, and that is the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre thought he had a disproof of the existence of God. That is, he thought he could actually show that believing in God was logically incoherent. So let's take a look at these seven proofs, or false proofs, in order. And the first one we'll look at is St. Anselm's proof. Bertrand Russell tells us that when he was a student, at one time walking across the quad at Cambridge, it struck him with luminous clarity that Anselm's proof was valid. And he said for about 48 hours he was a believer and then he discovered a flaw in it and decided he wasn't a believer anymore. So let's see why St. Thomas rejects Anselm's proof. Well, Anselm's proof consists really of four assertions. The first is, what is a notion of God that all people share, even atheists? That is, even though you don't believe God exists, when I use the word God, it communicates something to you. A unicorn doesn't exist, but you understand what I mean by the word. A centaur doesn't exist, but you understand what I mean by the word. So he begins with our concept of God. That is how we conceive of God. And he says everyone, even the atheist, conceives of God as that greater than which nothing can be conceived. That is, all of you have the concept of God as a supreme being. He is that greater than which nothing can be conceived. And he says, well, will you agree with him on that? Well, for the sake of argument, let's agree with him. All of us conceive of God, even those of us who are atheists, as that greater than which nothing can be conceived. Now we have the second proposition of the argument. Conceiving of something as existing actually and mentally is conceiving of something greater than that which exists mentally alone. I take it a real five dollar bill is greater than a fictitious five dollar bill. That is, you can spend it at a corner shop, you can hold it in your hand. So conceiving of something that exists both actually and mentally is to conceive of something greater than if you thought of that thing as existing mentally alone. So that's his second premise. Then he says, and he, this leads him to the conclusion, thus you must conceive of God as existing both actually and mentally. Otherwise you're driven into a logical contradiction. If you couldn't conceive of God as existing both, if you didn't conceive of God as existing both actually and mentally, then it would be possible to conceive of something greater than which, than that thing, greater than which nothing can be conceived. Now let's spell out the terms of the argument, because I know it sounds confusing put that way. But let's see if you've agreed that if something exists actually and mentally, it's greater than something that exists mentally alone. Let's imagine we concede that. Now you say, well, I'm consisting of God as existing mentally alone. And I say, well, I'm con uh, conceiving of God as existing both actually and mentally. Well, that means I'm conceiving of something greater than you are, doesn't it? You know, if you conceive of an actual $5 bill, you're conceiving of something greater than a fictitious $5 bill. 
Well, if I conceive of God as actually existing, then I'm conceiving of something greater than you are if you conceive of him as only existing fictitiously. And if you refuse to conceive of God as existing actually and mentally, you fall into a logical contradiction. You said that God was that greater than which nothing can be conceived. Well, now you're admitting that it is possible to conceive of something greater than God, namely God existing actually rather than God existing mentally alone. Any questions about Anselm's proof? That is, God is that greater than which nothing can be conceived. That which exists actually is greater than something that exists mentally alone. Therefore, we have to conceive of God as existing actually. If we, conce if we conceived of him as existing mentally alone, well, then we could conceive of something greater than God, namely the actual God rather than the fictitious God. So he tries to convince you that you fall into a logical contradiction unless you conceive of God as existing both actually and mentally. Any questions about Anselm's proof? Anyone feel that I can clarify it for them? I can only clarify things when you ask me questions. I mean, we want to put Aquinas' objection to Anselm's proof, of course. But first we want to understand it. And that is, look at the blackboard. God is that greater than which nothing can be conceived. Something that exists actually and mentally is greater than something that exists mentally alone. Therefore, we must conceive of God as existing both actually and mentally. After all, if we conceived of God as existing mentally alone, well then look at the problem we have. God existing actually and mentally would be greater than God existing mentally alone, wouldn't it? So we've contradicted our own definition. That is, we have, uh, we're in the position over here. Well, he would say, if you can find a flaw in it, point it out. That is, he, he would say, if you know of someone who dissents from the notion that God is greater than that which nothing can be conceived, who is that person? And is what they're saying plausible? You would suggest that all of these people, um, everyone who refuses to accept that God exists in actuality is... Is a, in a logical contradiction because they are betrayed... Pardon? Yes, they're, they're only in contradiction if they will accept that definition of God, and they also must accept the proposition that none of you have focused on yet, and that is that something that exists actually and mentally is greater than that which exists mentally alone. And I think actually you can with profit focus on that assumption. Now let's take it step by step, uh, what might be the matter with this particular proof. First, St. Thomas points out that uh, merely of conceiving of something as existing is not the same as saying that the thing exists. If you conceive of a perpetual motion machine, you have to conceive of something that requires no energy to keep it going, right? I mean, that's what a perpetual motion machine is. Does that show that a perpetual motion machine actually exists? Well, of course it doesn't. There's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine, is there? So if you're going to conceive of a perpetual motion machine, you have to conceive of it as something that requires no energy input to keep going. I mean, that's the very concept of a perpetual motion machine. You don't have to feed gasoline in. You don't have to feel electricity in. It's a self-moving thing, isn't it? But the mere fact that I have to conceive of a perpetual motion machine as being in perpetual motion doesn't mean that there is any existing entity in the universe that qualifies as a perpetual motion machine. In point of fact, we've tried to make one endlessly, and there's always a trick. Usually the trick is that the person has harnessed a force we don't think about, namely gravity. You know, usually the trick of the machine is that actually gravity is putting energy into it, even though we're not feeding gasoline or electricity into it 
you know, there, there's, a, there's always some energy input or the thing would stop, wouldn't it? So nothing in the universe qualifies as a perpetual motion machine, even though we share a common concept of what it would be to be a perpetual motion machine. Another way in which modern philosophers put this argument is that existence is not an analytic predicate. Now what they mean by that is something like this. You can't deny that a square has four sides because that would be logically incoherent, wouldn't it? I mean, to say a square has three sides would turn it into a triangle. To say that a square had five sides would be to turn it into a pentagon. But you can deny that any square actually exists. And in fact, you'd be right, wouldn't you? Because even Cathedral Square in Christchurch isn't a perfect square, is it? You know, it's not got perfectly straight lines or 90 degree angles, does it? So they would say that many things can be analytic predicates. You may say that a husband is a married male, but if marriage has died out completely in our society, there'd be no such thing as a husband, would there? In other words, there are analytic predicates of the concept of husband. Namely, a husband has to be a male and a husband has to be married. But existence is never an analytic predicate. Existence always has to be vouched for by experience. That is, if I said a red balloon is floating in the hall, well, without going out on the hall, you would be able to tell me what a red balloon was. But you could only tell me that it was out there if you went out and looked, wouldn't it? You could sit here and use logic from now until doomsday, and you would never know whether it was a fiction that there was a red balloon in the hall or whether one was really there. So any time you posit the existence of something, that is not a predicate that can be deduced by logic. It has to be checked against experience. And that, of course, plays into the atheist's hands, does it not? He would say, all right, show me evidence of the existence of God that's available to the senses, correct? You see the point. And then you can say, what about miracles? And you get into a long argument about whether the veracity of the people who talk about miracles is to be trusted, etc., etc., don't you? So it complicates the argument, doesn't it? So another way of putting St. Thomas's point is that most predicates can be derived analytically from a concept. But Anselm is trying to do the impossible when he tries to derive from the concept of God the fact that God exists. Existence is not an analytic predicate. He would have to produce evidence of God's existence. He can't do it by pure logic. You see the point St. Thomas is making. He says the mere fact that we must conceive of God as existing does not show that God actually exists. The mere fact that you have to conceive of a perpetual motion machine as requiring no energy input does not mean that there is any machine in the universe that doesn't require an energy input. Now, I think there's a much more direct way of discrediting this argument, and that is by focusing on the cash value of what the words greater than mean. I mean, the example I gave you with money is pretty defective. Uh, not only is a real $5 bill more spendable than a fictitious $5 bill, a real one-cent piece is more spendable than a fictitious billion dollars, isn't it? You know, I mean, you can't spend a fictitious billion dollars either, can you? And yet there seems to be something strange about saying that a one cent piece is greater than a billion dollars. Or let me put it another way. Let us imagine that I showed you the photograph of an elephant. And uh, it was the photograph of a huge bull elephant. And then I showed you a baby elephant. Well, you'd have to say that the baby elephant was greater than the photograph of the huge bull elephant, wouldn't you? Because one exists actually and the other exists mentally alone, doesn't it? In other words, it looks like this is comparing apples and pears. Uh, a, a, an elephant, the photograph of an elephant is not a diminished or tiny elephant. It's something different entirely. It's a photograph. A real elephant is a real elephant, and a photograph of an elephant is not an elephant at all, is it? 
So to say that the real elephant is a greater elephant than the photograph is really nonsense, isn't it? You know, a real elephant is not something greater and a photograph is not a diminished elephant. A photograph of an elephant is not an elephant at all. It's a photograph. My memory of my father is not of a man who is somehow dwarfed compared to an actual living human being. My memory is a memory. And the actual human being is an existing person, isn't it? And to say that one is greater of, than the other is to imply that they are somehow of the same kind. I can tell you that 12 apples is greater than 10 apples, can't I? But to tell you that one existing apple is greater than a photograph of an apple is very odd because they're two different things. One has to be judged as an apple and the other is a photograph. You see my point. You can only compare things that are of the same kind. You can say one existing elephant is bigger than another. That makes sense. One existing elephant is more powerful than another. That makes sense. One photograph of an elephant is clearer than another photograph. That makes sense. You know, one photograph of the camera might have been in focus and the other photograph it wasn't. But to compare the elephant and the photograph of the <coughs> elephant as if you could rank them in terms of greater or less appears to be a simple mistake. Well, they're of a different kind in the sense that the elephant can trumpet and the photograph can't. Uh, the elephant can produce offspring and the photograph can't. I mean, we decide that the thing is different from the photograph in the same way you would decide that a dead elephant is different from a living elephant. I've not seen the same argument, argument to two living element, elephants. Then maybe one has a longer trout. Do we call them a different kind? Well, that's right. I mean, existing elephants all have differences. One has a longer trunk, one is bigger, one is smaller, one may be older, one may be younger. But I take it that those are not the differences that distinguish elephants from photographs of elephants. The distinguish, what distinguishes them is whether they have the predicate existence. You see, it ties into the earlier argument. The real elephant, however punny, is an existing thing. The photograph, even if it's the biggest elephant that ever lived, is a mere photograph of a non-existing entity, isn't it? And you have to ask yourself, how can we compare these things in terms of greater than less? Over here. Well, I mean, isn't the point that what we're comparing here is concept, we're comparing concepts of God here. <coughs> and so, and these concepts of God have different qualities. They are greater than that which, greater than which would not nothing be can be conceived. conceived. The, point, the fact of the matter is, is that the quality of the concept of God being actual, whether or not that is the concept of actuality that we're really talking about, aren't we? Rather than a natural physical existence, we're talking about the concept of it being of them physically. Well, this existing. is St. Thomas's point, that merely because you have to conceive of God as existing doesn't show that anything in the universe that exists deserves the name God. But doesn't it mean that that concept is greater than the concept of God non-existing? The concept of a perpetual motion machine existing, uh, and, you, and essentially what... Um, Anselm is saying is that the concept of this perpetual motion machine existing is greater than the concept of a perpetual motion machine it's a fiction. not existing. Yeah, and, all we, and uh, the way to attack this argument is to say the difference between an existing and a non-existing thing cannot be a quantitative comparison. It's a qualitative comparison, you know. A quantitative comparison you can do with only things that are of the same kind. You know, you, I can see that today in this classroom, sadly, there are only about 70 students when there should be 100. And 30 students will wonder why they flunk the course. Well, you all know. Uh, so uh, I can distinguish between 70 students being here and 80 students being here. To say that each of you are greater than a fictitious Bertrand Russell who might be sending, sitting here is very strange. 
Uh, I mean, in point of fact, none of you would understand the lecture as well as he would if he were here. But the fact that he isn't here means he can't understand the lecture at all. You know, he's just not here. It's like saying that an existing imbecile has a greater mind than my concept of Bertrand Russell. Well, he does in a sense because he's got a mind and my concept of Bertrand Russell doesn't have a mind at all. But it is not a very sensible comparison. Do you see the point? And therefore I think Aquinas is quite right to reject Anselm's proof. Uh, so this in his mind clears the way for his offering his own five ways, that is, his own five proofs of the existence of God. Now, the first of these proofs is that you'll note that St. Thomas starts with something observable, not with mere ideas. And he says, all of you can observe that there is motion in the universe. You can observe me fiddling with this pointer. I can observe you writing with your pens. We can observe the planets moving through the heavens. We can observe children running around at a playground. So all of us can take as absolutely certain that motion exists. Now we all know that what's in motion today was caused by what was in motion yesterday or a moment ago, two seconds ago. If you see a billiard ball moving along the table, it was put in motion by a billiard ball that hit it a moment ago, wasn't it? So we all know that there are sequences of movers leading back into the past. Well, he argues that you cannot imagine such a sequence extending infinitely in the past or there would be no first cause of the whole sequence of motion. In this particular case, we assume there must be someone with a pool cue that started the thing going, don't we? So if we see a billiard ball in motion, we think, well, we can't posit an infinite number of billiard balls going into the past. There has to be some origin of that sequence of motion. That is supposedly one proof, and of course this unmoved prime mover he will eventually claim as God, though he has a number of steps to go first. At present we wouldn't call it God, we would just call it the unmoved prime mover, the explanation of all the motion in the universe. He makes the same argument about causality. He says every effect that exists in this room at this moment was caused by something that existed a moment ago. You know, if you show me a burn on your hand, it was caused by your touching a radiator a moment ago. If you ask why is the radiator hot, I can point to someone turning the radiator on two moments ago. If you can ask why turning that little knob on the radiator works, I can give you the theory of electricity or the theory of thermodynamics. You see the point. So he would say just as there are chains of movers going into the past, there are also chains of causality going into the past. And he makes the same argument. He says you can't posit an infinite change of causality of going into the past or you would have no explanation of the causal effects of today. You have to posit an uncaused first cause. And of course he is eventually going to try to convince you that that's God. Now actually, all you'd have to posit, as we'll see in a moment, is that there might be a multiplicity of uncaused first causes, wouldn't you? In other words, even if he can prove that there's an uncaused first cause, it could leave you as a, being a polytheist. Uh, Aristotle used the causal argument, and depending how you count them, he had about 35 to 56 unmoved prime movers. He thought every different type of motion must have a different origin. You know, growth was one type of motion, and running around the room was another type of motion, and the movement of the planets was another type of motion. And he used much the same argument, but in his mind they didn't all lead back to one uncaused first cause, they led back to a multiplicity of uncaused first causes. And we'll see in a moment that Aquinas feels that even if he has demonstrated that gods exist, he hasn't shown you that they need be singular rather than plural. Over here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite clear on why he's saying there can't, there can't be an infinite series of causes. Why can't that? Yes. Well, most of us today find these two arguments unconvincing. That is, we would say, after all, you can imagine an endless sequence of billiard balls going into the future, can't you? 
That is, if a ball today has momentum, it'll transfer that to another ball an instant from now, and it'll transfer that to another ball two instants from now. Yeah. And if we can imagine that going infinitely into the future, why not imagine it going infinitely in the past? And I think this is one of the reasons why these two arguments have relatively few adherents today. The third one is a little more tricky, and that is the argument from necessary versus contingent being. Now, St. Thomas says, you are only contingent being. We can all imagine the things that are necessary to sustain you in existence. For example, you can only exist within a relatively uh, narrow range of temperatures, right? If someone uh, set fire to this room and the temperature got too hot, that would be the end of you, wouldn't it? And you can only exist if there's oxygen in this room. And you can only, you know, there are a whole range of things on which your existence is contingent. And he says, now imagine that everything that exists in the universe today exists merely as contingent being. Well, what would that mean? Well, what it would supposedly mean is this. Let us imagine that for the sake of simplification, only a thousand things exist in the universe. Of course, there are billions and billions of things, but St. Thomas would say that's irrelevant to the argument. Now, every one of those thousand things only exists problematically. That is, each one of those thousand things at this moment has nine chances out of ten of being in existence and one chance in ten of not being in existence. Uh, your, your chances are much higher than that, of course. I mean, you, it's hard to see why you would go out of existence in the next instant unless a meteorite struck. So your chances of being in existence at this particular instant might be about, uh, oh, a million to one. But we've agreed that it's problematic, that you are not a necessary being, you're a contingent being. Now imagine someone, a thousand people sitting in a room. So here are a thousand people and they're matched each to the things. And they're all flipping coins. Now imagine that you have an infinite amount of time. Well, if you had an infinite amount of time, everyone's number would come up simultaneously, wouldn't it? That is, the odds against all thousand of you hitting that unlucky one chance in ten simultaneously would be very small. But with an infinite amount of time, it would inevitably occur. So if everything in the universe existed contingently, nothing could exist today because you have an infinite amount of time if you don't believe in God going into the past, don't you? So if everything in this universe exists contingently and you posit that everything has an infinite life history, an infinite amount of time going into the past, sooner or later in the past, at one point, everyone's number would have come up at once. And of course, if nothing had ever existed at any time in the past, nothing would exist today, would it? So now we have an argument that depends on the senses but is absolutely certain. All of you know things exist today. And all of you know that nothing would exist today if everything in the universe was contingent being. So there must be at least one necessary being who is self-sufficient for its own existence. Now note I said the word at least because there could be a million of them, couldn't there? I mean, all he has shown is that there must be at least one necessary being. He hasn't shown that it would have to be a unity. So at this point, he doesn't claim to have shown you that there is one God, but he claims to have shown you that there must at least be a multiplicity of gods. That is, a multiplicity of necessary beings. Uh, Father Benedict Ashley, a friend of mine at the Dominican House of Studies in Chicago, was a student Trotskyite. And one day he became convinced of the proof from necessary being, and he is now a Dominican monk in Chicago. So the proof from necessary being is not trivial. Now we've run out of time, but I'll take one question before we go on next time. Just Pardon? Just because something's logically possible, it doesn't follow that it had to have occurred. So just because it's logically possible that at one point in time, during the past. Ah, but he would say it's not logically possible, it's logically n necessary. You see, if, if there had never been a necessary being 
and there had only been contingent beings, then today there would be nothing. So now we'll have to take this up next time. You see me after class. And we'll start with this next time for the benefit of the class.